Yes, everybody, and welcome back to Tar Heel Illustrated. Com. I'm Jacob Turner. He's Andrew Jones. And AJ, we're here for an edition of the UNC Basketball Show. Been a, been a long time since we've, we've done one of these, but with the season kind of being in full swing right now, Carolina nine games in, sitting at seven and two, we figured it was a, a good time to, to come on here and, and talk about it. I know you've talked about the basketball in a drop, and we've done a podcast on them a week or so ago as well. So we have talked a little bit of basketball. This is going to be a very UNC basketball focus pod, of course, with it being you, the UNC basketball show. So looking forward to talking a little bit of that with you. This show is brought to you by underdog fantasy. We'll talk about them a little bit later on. Stay tuned for that, but a big thank you to them for, for sponsoring. But, the show. Mm-hmm. but we are seeking a basketball yes. podcast sponsor. Yes. Underdog Underdog's is a little bit more football. football. Uh, yeah, it's been more football, and we want to sub, we want to uh, differentiate. We're looking for someone who wants to sponsor our basketball pods. These are three things. Anything, man. Uh, basketball drops, that kind of stuff. Yeah. We they get do one, numbers one, too. One, one, out, one business that sponsors all that, and yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it works for football with the other stuff. But we get more traffic on basketball obviously oh, no doubt about it man basketball is just a little bit different so, animal when it comes to that you, you can reach out to us just follow send us something through the twitter dm or yeah. if you have a, if you can access my personal information i could give it out on here but um you could find my email address or my phone number it's not too too terribly hard to find yeah just reach out to us twitter at hill illustrated links in the description below yeah that's know. the best way to do it go through us through our twitter dm go from there super easy super easy to do and we'll get back to you quickly yeah, for, and, for, and, for, and for honestly and for, if you're a carolina guy and you have a business and it's part of way you'd be a little bit connected a little bit more connected to Tar Heels uh, we we um we be happy to talk yeah. be kind of fun yeah of course man just hit us up bring, bring we'll some bring watch. someone new into into the under the, the THI tent 100 percent would absolutely love to do that and uh, basketball content tends to do very well because it is Carolina basketball so you get some good good eyes and good exposure Win or lose. loyal listeners so yeah a lot of loyal listeners Win on the basketball side football football, football football is more dependent on, on yeah. outcome yeah basketball's yeah. just traffic regardless because yeah, it is yeah. the church of carolina basketball. it's a different animal man it is a different animal completely and you learn that pretty quickly all i have to do is go look at the view view counts on on basketball compared to football especially when football starts struggling a little bit but besides that aj we're here to talk a little carolina basketball nine games in seven and two coming off a loss to to uconn i think a lot of fans still walked away from that game feeling pretty dang good about this team and i think for a lot of reasons they, they should feel pretty good about this team and what they could potentially do so what is the mood of the team right now is it very similar to the fan base with a lot of optimism a lot of you know excitement surrounding this team despite you know two early losses in the season well after uh the yukon game i wrote my column about how the vibe i got in the locker room was encouragement they obviously wanted to win they were disappointed they yeah, want they didn't win but they understood why they didn't and i think that they kind of showed themselves that, okay, we can kind of play with these guys. Yeah. Uh, Cormac's 0 for 6, and Cormac's 2 for 6. I think maybe it's a different game. True. I, I think that that's the way they view the world. Maybe be a little bit better defensively. Some of those dribble drives or leaving some wide open three-point shooters. Maybe convert a little bit more off the offensive glass, that kind of thing. There are Reading some areas that, like, like they, like the, the beautiful thing about the stretch of games that they've had, and that game in particular was, you know, Armando really caught it a measuring stick, and it was okay. Here's where we are tonight. Here's where the big dog is, and let's face it, UConn is back big time. Under good team, Danny Hurley. really good team. Ain't going away. Exceptionally well coached team. Yes. And a talented team. I don't think they're more talented than Carolina. I don't think I just so. Either, think man. that they they had a better organization to them mm-hmm. on the court, and they played better as a group than Carolina did. And they they hit shots more shots than Carolina did. So the vibe in the locker room was not bad. Mm-hmm. Sometimes when they lose, you go in the locker room and they're guys that just kind of want to avoid you. And there's guys that are sitting down, they're slumped, or they're just buried, their face is buried in their phone. They don't really want to get up and stuff. That wasn't the case Tuesday night. It was it, it was a locker room in which the two spokesmen of the team, RJ and Armando, sat there and said, look, you know, we could have won this game. Uh, we, we, we need to get better. We learned a lot about ourselves. And they weren't discouraged at all. Last year, I go in the locker room in Blacksburg, they were discouraged. Oh yeah. 
five days later, I go in the locker room in Bloomington, Indiana, and they were discouraged. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of heads down and towels over the head. And that's why I wrote the column I did. Like there were no towels over heads in that locker room. So I think nine games in with this being the ninth game, I think they feel like they're way ahead of where they were a year ago. And Marmondo even said, look, if you would have told me seven and two playing out this way, I'd have been pretty pleased Mm -hmm. because it's still at the time of the game. He said, we'll see them again. Armando told us we'll see them again. And when the moment he said that it was still 104 days before the NCAA tournament even started. So you get a measuring stick game after some other games that give you a lot, a, a strong indication of who you are. And you now got 104 days before the NCAA tournament starts to creep in that direction. So, the question is, will they creep in that direction? There's some other things to hit on, too, about, you know, how how their composition is used, mm-hmm. how, 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 the, how Hubert employs all the different basketball strategies and tactics for this group moving forward. How much does that creep them forward? I think from a personnel standpoint, they genuinely believe that they have an opportunity to in 104 days and really it would be 111 before they meet UConn again because it wouldn't be until the second weekend. Mm -hmm. So I think they believe that they can be ready to face that juggernaut again and maybe beat them at that point. And and I say there's no reason any Carolina fan should sit here right now and say, oh, if we face UConn in March, we're doomed. I don't no. think that that should be the belief at all. I doubt that that is the belief. But no, it, it isn't. It, it really isn't. It seems like the fan base is, again, despite you know some early losses to, again, good teams, and they've also beat some good teams as well. The vibe, even after the UConn game, was, yeah, some things that they need to work on, some improvements they need to work on didn't shoot well. You know, Ryan didn't shoot well, and some other guys maybe didn't have the games they wanted to. But you can still see that this team can can be pretty good. And, again, I think that comes with some of the wins they've had. I mean, <laughs> We were talking last year, you know, again, we've said this example so many times where we're sitting there in, you know, February and April. I wonder if Ohio State's going to beat this team because they beat this team. Then Carolina's win net win moves up to that. And all, we don't want to do that again. Carolina, thankfully for, for for us more than anything, coming in. So we don't have to do that anymore. They have picked up some of those quality wins against some good opponents, Arkansas and, and Tennessee, obviously being two that stand out the most and even Florida State to a degree, because I think they're a, a decent basketball well, team as well. Yeah. So. The league's better, mm-hmm. too. So they're going to get a little more. You're going 11 and 9, and they should do much better 11 and 9, by the way. But having a winning record in league play is going to matter more because it means you're going to pick up better NET net wins, mm-hmm. but they still have more to go. Oh, yeah. Right now, Villanova, right now, Villanova can end up hurting them. True. Because Villanova stinks. Mm-hmm. They, they've lost four games. They, they've lost, they're 0 3 in the Philadelphia area. Surprising. So, to teams in, the, pretty to good teams in the Philadelphia area, they just lost to Kansas State. They went on the road. That's part of the Big East Big 12 challenge. They lost to Drexel. They lost to Penn and they lost to St. Joe's. Wow. Surprising. And, and, I'm surprised by that. But I they really won am. the battle for Atlantis. I know. Isn't that crazy? It doesn't really make a lot of sense, does it? Well, in college basketball doesn't make a lot of sense, which is why you got to play a lot of games to sort yeah. things out. Think about Kentucky. How good did Kentucky look against Miami? And then they lose at home to UNCW, which, by the yeah. way, is a good team and, and a pretty well coached team. But well coached team, yeah. UNCW had just lost by thirty at App State. Oh yeah, they did. Didn't it's they? college basketball. Yeah. That's App why State beat no Auburn one, at home. I mean, it's a weird time. No one game in college basketball is a referendum. Unlike football, where games can be referendums, in bas- college basketball, no one game is a referendum, regardless yeah. of the outcome, regardless of the opponent, except the national championship game or maybe NCAA tournament games because it's one and done you lose and you're out. So uh, in regular season, especially November, December, there ain't nothing, there ain't no such thing as referendum in college basketball. No, really it's really the whole really. season, which is why to make the vibe from the locker room after losing to UConn and MSG Tuesday night, if they lose to Kentucky, will I get the same vibe in the locker room then? If they lose to Oklahoma, which by the way is much, much improved, well, I get the same vibe then. I don't know. I think mm-hmm. this team needs to show progress during these 11 days in between games. They don't play again until they take on Kentucky and Atlanta on December 16th. Mm-hmm. They do have to show some progress because Hubert said after the game, this is us time. 
they had been in sort of that game mode for a month where they prep for a game, take a day off, prep for a game, have their day off, that kind of thing. Now they have just themselves. They're finishing exams and then they can pre- they can do two a days. So if school's not in session, they can practice as much as they want, basically. They're not going to, but they'll have a lot of film time, a lot of self time. And they're going to fix some things, maybe throw a couple things out, maybe add a few things to what they're doing. Um, maybe this is an opportunity for Hubert to evaluate some things personally, like how he's gone about some stuff that maybe look real hard at how he used the bench. I know that's one of the things we're probably going to talk about as well. That's something that people have been bringing up. Uh, you know, there's there's a lot of stuff still because this is still a a club that's still a bunch of pieces coming together they haven't fully come together yet and there are a couple no. pieces that are a little bit further outside the, the cluster than we thought they would be and Hubert has to figure out a way to bring the Jalen Withers piece into the cluster more for example and AJ that's that's what I want to talk about I've been actually looking forward to talking to you about the bench or lack thereof bench minutes since the Villanova game for a few days now. Cause I, it was one thing that I, I tweeted it out the morning after the UConn game. And I had a lot of Carolina fans agree with me and a lot of Carolina fans that didn't, but for me, what I was pointing out in that tweet, when I was saying is the lack of rotation becoming an issue, I think it may be, I was really just pointing out a trend that I've noticed again, since that loss to Villanova. And if you just go look at the box scores before that, in, in the four games after that, and you'll see just how the, the bench minutes, especially from a couple of guys, have have really dwindled. And the reason I wanted to talk about it, AJ, is because I, I do think Hubert made some evaluations in the offseason and has, and has changed some things and, it, and has developed as a coach in a lot of ways. And I think there is some positives and a lot of positives you can take away from some of the learning and, and again, changes and tweaks that he made from yeah. last year and this offseason to now. I think there's a lot of positives, a lot of things you can get him, give him credit for. But the bench thing, again, is becoming a worry for me because I was talking to you off camera. I was talking to a Carolina fan earlier this week for like an hour about this. And I said, you know, Hubert played for Dean Smith, coached behind Roy Williams for 10 years. And and Roy, I I was kind of using the the phrase, you know, he kind of wrote the book on developing a bench early in the season, sacrificing maybe some games that you could have win for a a, a more long-term goal of, I'm going to have my team ready and everybody bought in understanding what their roles are by the time we get to February um, in March in April. And if you can make it that far, Roy had a great ability at his team's peaking at the right time. And and again, developing a bench early in the season so they can be called upon in bigger moments as, as games get more important as the season goes on. And if you look at the bench, I'm talking about Wojcik, you know, Jalen Washington, Jalen Withers as well, and even Zayden High to it to an extent. Just haven't seen a lot of minutes since that Villanova game, and for me, that's a little bit worrying. And a lot of Carolina fans have been on to me and be like, "Well, they haven't been producing when they've gotten those three minutes in the first half." And for me, confidence is is breeded. I've said this so many times last year, and again, I'm not picking at Hubert here. I'm just pointing out a trend that I think is worrying that a a coach's number one job is to get the best out of his players. It's to build confidence in his players. It's to build a rotation as a basketball coach where you can count on, you know, eight, nine guys, especially when you look at some of the talent that they have on the bench. And again, we just haven't seen that as much over the last four games. And for me, some, I think some, I use this analogy with the Carolina fan I was talking to. I think that some fans look at players as robots at times. And I was using the analogy of a Roomba. Everybody knows what a Roomba is, a little electronic vacuum that you put in your closet and you hit the button and it goes and does its thing. Players aren't robots. You, you, can, you can leave a Roomba in the closet and not use it for two weeks or barely use it for two weeks. And when you hit that button and say, go clean my house, it's going to perform the same way every time. There's no, there's no difference. Play, players aren't like that, especially early in the year. You can't use a guy for 20 minutes this game and then they play five minutes a game here and then three minutes here and then six minutes here. And then throw them into the fire in ACC play. We saw examples of this last year. And be like, hey, I need you to go now play 15 minutes because this guy's in foul trouble or this guy's injured or this guy's not performing well. It, it doesn't work like that. Confidence has to be breeded early on. Trust has to be given into players. Players, especially coming from a different program into an environment like UNC, where it's a totally different level of expectation and pressure that comes along with it. A coach's job is to bed him into that rotation so they can get used to playing with guys, used to get playing with RJs and Armandos, the guys that are going to play 30-plus minutes a game and get used to what their role is. 
and, and, and to me, AJ, that's the tw- trend that I'm worried about. I've, I've seen that playing time for a lot of these guys kind of dwindle where it just kind of feels like they're going to come in around that 12, 10 minute mark in the first half. Maybe, maybe a little bit earlier than that. They're going to play four or five minutes. They might come in for a minute or two to spell somebody in the second half, but it, it, it it's six guys in the second half and, and really five guys and nobody else is coming into the game besides maybe like Seth Trimble when it really matters. So have Am I overreacting? Am I overreaching here and, and maybe pointing out a problem that really isn't a problem? Because to me, the stats don't lie. The numbers don't lie when it looks at it. And again, I, I just think it's a worrying trend because there's no way that you can go back and look at Hubert and in, in, in Carolina basketball in the two years that he's been here so far and not say that a lack of bench rotation is has hurt this team. Just go listen to the press conferences after the national championship game. Carolina got tired. The players talked about it because they didn't really have a real rotation there. It happened last year in a lot of examples where you could just tell, you know, guys didn't play for a few weeks and all of a sudden they're asked to play 20 minutes in Raleigh against NC state and they don't perform very well. Am I, am I looking for, am I pointing out something that's not really there? AJ, what's your take on the bench, the bench minutes right now? I think your point comes from what you alluded to is that that's what people know. That was the biggest question about Hubert coming in was what he used to bench. And that's not a question that just kind of fell in front of everybody. Well, oh, here's this sounds like a good question to yeah, wonder. We just like so invented, yeah. There, there, there was there was valid reason to wonder that, and the messaging from within the program publicly was not going to be an issue. Got a lot of guys. This is Hubert's team, Hubert's roster. Yeah. So the first sign of him tightening things up, people are like, whoa, especially if they lose, and they were down against Florida State for most of the game. And they won and they were down while playing a tight rotation. And that was one of the reasons why I think they played a tight rotation because he's so over focused on winning that day. It's like, oh man, we're down eight Florida state. I can't take RJ off the floor, put mm-hmm. South out there, or I can't take Armand off the floor and put Jalen out there because we got to win this game. And that's part of his development still as a coach is coaches talk about trust the process. They have to trust the process too. Trust the process just isn't a motto that you can stamp on a T-shirt or a, a write on the blackboard or, 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 you know, put in some like a poster in the bulletin board. The or, or or so, yeah, put in the weight room or something like that. The coach has to do it, too. And part of trusting the process is, OK, Jalen Withers hasn't played very well late. Some of the practices haven't been great, but I know what kind of player he is because I saw him at Louisville. I saw him early this year for our team. He started the Tennessee game, for goodness sakes. The best thing a guy like that needs, I'm going to stick him out there. Jalen can play against the Yukons and the Florida States and Tennessees of the world because he's been doing it for a few years. All right? Disregard what the team's success rate was. When he first started playing minutes, they were a much better team. So just he needs to play. He needs confidence. Jalen's going to play eight or nine minutes, 10 minutes in a row. He's going to go through the cycle of the TV timeout substitutions and that kind of thing. I I think trusting the process as a coach doing that. I think it would be helpful for Jalen and for the team. If Hubert did that Jalen Washington comes in sometimes for two, three minutes, he's out. Yeah. He didn't come back in. And and, and my thing about him is that he bangs in practice against Armando. And I was talking to someone about this other day, and I think I may have mentioned it in the drop I did for Friday. Armando is a guy he bangs all the time, but there is nobody else in college basketball he's going to go up against. It's like Armando. So when he gets into a game, he's dealing with big men that he hasn't dealt with in practice. So that tells me that he needs some extended minutes there. It keeps Armando fresher. Jalen offensively can give you production. Defensively is where he needs a lot of the work. He's still sometimes, I think, he's 6'10 with a long reach, like seven two wingspan, but I think he plays smaller than 6'10 in the paint sometimes. He fades on his jumpers. Guy like that just goes straight up. That was Bryce Johnson. Yeah, yeah. I remember Roy kind of went after me one time when I asked him a question about Bryce fading on jumpers. And he was. And then Bryce exploded his senior year because he's going straight up. He wasn't fading. Jalen's got a lot of that in him. And he's got to learn to play stronger, more physically. And he's got to do that on the defensive end as well. And he's going to get that in games as well as just as practice. But maybe more in games some ways because he's going to be going up against more conventional big guys. And Armando in 2023 is not a conventional big guy. So then there's the Paxson Wojcik factor where he did start earlier. Now, the other night, 
the sign that showed me that Paxson's confidence is waning some is that in the second half, he got an offensive rebound right in front of the basket. And he double pumped, and there really wasn't great defense converging on him yet. But he still double pumped. I wouldn't say he double pumped air, but he double pumped a little bit. And then he allowed de- the defense to re- react, and he yeah. kicked the ball out to the perimeter instead mm-hmm. of just going up strong with it. And I think three weeks ago, he would have gone up strong with it. He may have gotten the thing blocked, but he would have gone up strong, and that's what you want. You, 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 you can handle a shot getting blocked sometimes if a guy's going up strong. Armando does all the time. He's never never faced by it because he goes up strong. You would want to see Paxson do that. Now, I think we're taught, we're looking at a situation here where you've got some guys that could have some confidence issues coming up. I think that happened to last year's group to a degree, but last year's group was nowhere near as ready to help as this year's group. The other component here about the FSU and UConn games that I think is something to keep an eye on moving forward is the diversity they have on the bench means that when you bring someone in, you're changing your team. It's not like you're bringing in lesser duplicates of who's on the floor already. So yeah, like, just like for like guys, yeah. Mm-hmm. So UConn, for example, everything was coming so easily. It's, I think I used with you, I may have done this in a podcast, I'm not even sure, but if you play a video game, and if you've heard this already, bear with me. If you play a video game, they all have different levels. I assume they still do. My my daughter yeah. plays video games all the time, but I don't quite understand it. But they all have levels. Yeah, there's levels. So yeah. level two, level, and they get harder with each level. You so let's say you play a video game, and let, let's say the video game is uh, Jacob's Delight, and mm-hmm. you're supposed to eventually conquer all the things that Jacob Turner loves in life, right? And there's twelve stages. There's eight stages, and you're dominant through six you but you have to start over every time start from one and work your way through mm-hmm. so you get to the point where you're going one two three you can actually watch tv and go through one yeah, two, it's three, easy. four mm-hmm. and it's easy and then you get through six okay we've got through six seven where you struggle yukon looked like it was operating in those first six levels because carolina was easy for them in a lot mm-hmm. of ways, from rebounding to offensively for UConn. Carolina was made a little bit more difficult for UConn defensively because Carolina's awfully talented. But my point is this. You bring in a Trimble, he's different from anybody that's in the starting five. You yeah. bring in either Jalen, they're different from anybody in the starting five. And even Wojcik to a degree, but certainly those first three, they changed the composition of what you have on the floor. They changed the way the team looks and moves and springs on on both ends of the floor. So just by simple virtue of changing that, you're changing the game a little bit. And I think there are times where that needs to, that needs to happen. You also can alter your approach. If you, even if you put them in the same cookie cutter uh, approach, they're still going to be different because they're different guys, but you put the Trimble out there. You you can, he, he can take the thing the take the ball to the basket get in the air and create problems with defenses. The other night's a game that Jalen Withers should have flourished in. He's a guy that can bruise. You, yeah. He's exactly what – teams like you, Connor, exactly why you bring in a Jalen Withers. Exactly. But he's not out there much. A guy like uh, Jalen Washington, maybe that's not the best game for him yet, but Florida State would be. But he didn't play a ton against Florida State. And he was 14 of 16 from the floor – going into the UConn game. So he has been productive in limited playing time. Mm -hmm. So I think you you want to change things up, but you you want to give guys a rest. You want to change things up and you want to be a diverse team. You want to have a lot of multiple looks and flavors to what you do. And that's what this bench should be able to provide. Mm -hmm. So it's a couple of games, 71 minutes and two games for the bench. Now they've got Kentucky and then Oklahoma. The bench is going to play a lot against Charleston Southern, and that's not going to mean anything. It'll mean something in that the guys get some minutes, but it's not going to mean anything in terms of where's Hubert's mind on this. How does he? How is he going to handle this moving forward? Kentucky and Oklahoma are the games where if the bench is at 30, 32 minutes in those two games, it's a problem because while the starters might be a lot better, if you're having Cormac Ryan do one of those over six nights, you got to see that. And you got to change things up yeah. because you have to be able to pull a guy and play another guy to rest them, 
to let him sit back and watch the game and see the game. It wouldn't have been terrible for Elliot Cadeau to have appeared on the bench the other night. And you got yeah, RJ and Seth out there and Seth as opposed to, to Elliot, what you lose, you also gain in other areas. Yeah. And you just change the game. You change the look, you change the feel, you change the taste, you change the smell out on the court by doing that. And I, I mean, metaphorically, obviously. No, I know what you mean. Yeah. So, so I think that that's, what the value in having this roster should be, but it wasn't like that in the last two games, with the exception of the press. He put Seth in for the press against Florida state and they went the three guard lineup and it worked. Now they did use the press briefly in the second half and Seth was out there. They had a quick spurt and then he pulled off. I think part of it was the team was tired. And I asked Hubert after the game, if they were tired because they, because they, 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 they cut tired the Yeah. Jacob, they cut it to 65-60, and RJ was just doing RJ stuff yeah, big time. Yeah. They cut to 65-60, but from that point on, UConn goes on an 18-6 run. Carolina misses 14-16 shots. That was legs. Yeah, of course. That was legs. So I, asked Armando, I asked Armando and RJ about it in the locker room. RJ kind of deflected a little bit. Armando did say, yeah, you know, I don't want to make that as an excuse, but it's not just the minutes play, but, our, but UConn, wears on you because Physical, the way they yeah, play. Mm-hmm. So a 40-minute game with UConn afterward, you may feel like it's a 60-minute game with an average ACC team mm-hmm. because it taxes you that much. Mm-hmm. And that's why – that's where I think a mistake was made the other night. Should have been rotating that stuff a lot. Should yeah. Just keeping his guys fresh. Well, I think – I just think this time of year, again, it's the time to do it. This is when you want to – this is when you have to develop a bench. You can't – Got even if they – even if they're not – Hundred percent ready. You got to put them out there because if if a if Jalen Washington gets eleven minutes a game, he's going to practice better. Yeah, just three minutes. He's not going to practice as well. And you have to you have to think about it too because again, these guys are new to the program. Like if we're talking about Wojcik and Withers in particular, even Zayden High, you can throw him in there. I mean, he, again, he's not a guy. I don't think coming into the season, I expected to play a ton, but he is an option on the bench. These guys are are new to the program. These guys are from Hubert's perspective, guys that you wanted to come in here. And I think there's also an element of well, if you want these guys to get used to playing with your your guys who are going to play a lot, and who is that? That is RJ and Armando, the two number one guys in particular that are going to play 30-plus and, and Ingram. Yeah, Ingram. and Ingram as well. Those are your three guys. And, and to me, you can only get used to playing with somebody in practice but so much. You have to be thrown into that game environment to know – tendencies to know how to operate with these guys on the floor. I don't think you can just do that in practice, especially when you're talking about the level of basketball that Carolina is playing on a week in a week out basis. They get everybody's best shot. It's because of that North Carolina written across the chest. For me, there has to be a comfort level, a betting in process of getting just used to playing with these guys. So you're more comfortable out there when your number's called. And I'm not seeing that. And the last thing I'll say AJ too, is the, the, even if there's a strategy to it, right? How many times and how great was Roy? And I'm going to bring this guy off the bench for one or two minutes because I know there's a TV timeout coming out and that'll give Marcus Page, instead of getting two minutes in a TV timeout off, he's now going to get five minutes of rest. So when he comes back in, he's fresher and he's better. Even if it's, there's a, some some kind of game plan to it of, I'm going to play these guys in the second half. They might not play for a 10 minute stretch, two or three minutes here and there. And they know what their roles are. And they know what they're being asked to do. So you can spell these RJs and these Armandos and these Ingrams just a few minutes because at this level, AJ, it is such fine margins when you want to compete for ACC titles and win national championships where it could be as simple as RJ has two or three minute rest here and Armando and Ingram get a two or three minute rest here and they are fresher in the final four minutes a game. And that's the difference between a one point win and a two point loss. You know what I mean? There, there's so many fine margins here where even just working it into your game plan a little bit more and being strategic about where you're putting these guys in. So their minutes go from five minutes in a game to maybe it's 10 minutes now because they're again, coming in these spurts and being asked to do different things. So for me, it's just, I think, I think Carolina's ceiling with playing six guys is here. And I think Carolina's six ceiling with potentially playing eight, maybe nine guys on a regular basis goes up. I, I just, for me, this team's not as good and won't win as many games if you're relying on six guys week in and week out, especially when you get into the thick of the season. That's my opinion. People might disagree. Yeah, I agree, especially because of the diversity the bench gives you. And yeah. when you're when you're talking about playing the bench a certain number of minutes a game, I don't think, and I said this before the season, I said it once we started seeing them play. I don't think this is a scenario where, Jalen Washington's got to get 14, 15 every night. 
You're no, a pencil no, no. man. Weather's got to get 20, 18, 20 every night. I think because they could be so situational, because they have the diversity that you want from a bench, there could be a game where Seth Trimble gives you 20 minutes. The next game maybe gives you six, seven minutes. Yeah. Withers, the other night, I mean, they're, they're playing a game that they're getting pounded on the glass. Mm-hmm. When you're playing six one, guys. Yeah. You're playing two six-foot guards. And then your three man has no rebounds over six on the floor, not getting rebounds. You got to change things up, yeah. get bigger, get some of every rebound is an extra possession. Exactly. And that's so huge. You're, you're, so get, be better. Now size doesn't always equate to rebounding, but Jalen Withers is a banger. Yeah. Okay. He can get rebounds. Jalen Washington can get rebounds. You know, change things up a little bit there. Move Harrison to the three, make Harrison more difficult. It took 10 minutes for Harrison Ingram to get a shot off the other night. I know. His first shot attempt was at 10 minutes. His second shot attempt was at five and a half. And he, and he ended it, up with 20 it makes, points. It makes a ton of sense, yeah. And even if that's the he's, message, like, hey, Jalen, go in and, and bang and get rebounds because we're struggling at that. At least you know what the just, role is. But know, they know what that's who they are. It. So uh, there are some games of football where you use multiple tight ends. There's some games where you don't. There's some games where you have to stack the box on defense. There's some games where, you know, you're in cover two most of the game, that kind of thing. So – you have to do different things. You have, you can't just try to be the same and navigate all trails the same way. Sometimes you need a bigger machete than others. Mm-hmm. Sometimes, you know, you, sometimes you need different, you need a, a compass, sometimes, whatever it is, whatever the, whatever the case is, I don't need to go into a bunch of different examples here, but you got to approach games that way. The other night was a game where you need a little bit more lunch pail. And I thought Carolina brought the lunch pail. Yeah. Yeah. Not saying Carolina that. battled. They competed. They did all those things, but Agreed. sometimes you got to go up that. a notch. Yeah. Somebody's got to go up a notch. So mm-hmm. well, that's what Jalen Withers is for. And you can give him confidence. Coach says, look, I trust you. I know you can do the job. You know, you, you banged already. Mm-hmm. I saw what you did at Louisville. I saw what you did earlier this year. Yeah, early in the year, he's on the floor. Yeah. Early mm-hmm. in the year, he's on the floor a lot. Go mm-hmm. after ball. I haven't seen him on the floor the last couple of games. So, and I think, I think that's when you can start to see, I don't want to, we'll move on in a second, but I think that's when you can kind of start seeing confidence dwindle too, because I mean, AJ, you played sports at a, you know, a high level in high school. I mean, you played high school sports. I, I played varsity soccer for four years, played travel soccer for 15 years. I mean, I, I'm not saying this, it relates to Carolina at all, but I, I can relate to it of when you're essentially, when you could, when you go from a starter, they were both starters. Let's say Wojcik and Withers at this point. And you go from a starter playing, and then you know Wojcik, for example, twenty minutes against Villanova, nowhere close to that since. It, it's we talk about human nature on here all the time, AJ, all the time, because human nature is such an important thing, and it plays such a big factor in sports. And I can just imagine being somebody. I, I put myself back in high school, and if I went from a starter to playing twenty minutes in a big game, and then um, last four games, I'm barely getting off the bench. You know, coach is looking over here, and he, he's not putting me in your confidence is going to go down a little bit. That That's natural. You, again, players aren't robots. You, you can't just not use them for two weeks and call on them and they're going to go in there and perform the same way. It doesn't work like that. That has to be breeded and coached and managed with your players. That's a coach's job. So again, I don't want to f- focus on too many negatives because I think Hubert has made a lot of positive changes yeah. going into the off season. We've seen that, but this is that, that trend that I'm seeing where I'm like, I'm not sure I like where this is headed because if this continues again, I just think the ceiling is so much different between a six man Carolina rotation and a eight man Carolina rotation. I, I just think it can be a lot better team, especially when you consider that these are guys that Hubert wanted. The, the excuse last year was what? Well, he didn't recruit these guys. He didn't want these guys. They don't fit his system. You went out and got these guys. You kept them around the program for a reason. I think you got to use them a little bit more. And that's yeah. just my message right now. Yeah. One last quick thing on that. Now I've come off the bench some in basketball in high school. And, and you know that when the coach looks down the bench, yeah, there's three mindsets. One, God, I hope he doesn't put me in. <laughs> it's true. Like, when, it's like true. when you're playing, Dem- like when you're playing Damatha, God, I hope yeah. he doesn't put me in. Yeah. I don't want right? to, I don't want any part of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, or boy, I hope coach puts me in. Yeah, and then yeah, there's yeah. the mindset where coach is going to put me in. I'm not worried about it. Mm-hmm. Those are the three mindsets. Uh, the first one, awful. You're not going to play well. The second one, you're going to be tight mm-hmm. because you weren't sure if you're getting in and you feel like you got to play well in order to stay in. Because if you every don't. Time you hear the horn, every time you hear the horn sound, you look at the scores table, see so who's checking in for you. Mm-hmm. Right? And then the third guy just plays, loses himself in the game and plays. And that's what you want. You want, guy, you want the guys like the third guy. Yeah. 
So even if it's, you know, the midpoint of the first half and Withers hadn't gotten in yet, you don't want him looking at the clock and wondering. Because you, you want him knowing because you know, time's going to come. You're, there's going to be a very situation where we're going to need you. And all of a sudden at the seven-minute mark, Huber calls him and he plays the rest of the half. Did you notice that with anybody in MSG? Did like, did you, could you see no, that? No, it, it, it's, it's a, it, I, no, you can't, no, you can't, you it can. would be, unfair, it would be unfair for me to speculate any of that at all. That wouldn't, mm -hmm. unless someone told me, no, I just know the experience because I've experienced all three of those things when yeah. I play and, yeah. I, and I've talked to guys in the aftermath about it. So mm -hmm. I know athletes, I know basketball players think that because I've talked to many that have said it in the past. I haven't talked to this group about it. It's a tough thing to bring up. It's something that you don't bring up in December yeah. yet because because you're still in the yet phase. Yeah. Now you get to late January, then it's different. Yeah, then it becomes kind of who's And it's and still again, not yeah. – it's a, it's the kind of thing you talk about when you build a rapport with a guy. Mm -hmm. And – what you built really, that and there's only two guys on this team I have a rapport with because they've been around for a while. Mm -hmm. I could ask one of them a question like that, but they're not dealing with this. Yeah, they're so. playing a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's just again, I think that if anything, if I'm pick if I'm picking anything that I make think might be an it, it, it is pick. It, it might be it bad. is, but it's something people people want us to talk about. Yeah. It. And it's again, it's it's because because there are a lot of positives, Jacob. Oh, of there, course. Yeah. I mean, Hubert strikes me. I sit seven feet away from him three times a week and he strikes me more as a head coach now than before like, yeah this i would is agree his program. even this from the outside looking now. in a little bit i would agree yeah this no, this is his program now mm -hmm. it's his yeah he strikes me more as a head coach i i i, I think the way he's using trimble's a pretty good way like there's no issue there no and with, ironically trimble played two more minutes against uconn than he did against fsu but look at the effect he had in the fsu game that's exactly. kind of what i'm talking about about effect guys can have on games um maybe i would have gone a little bit bigger against uconn yeah well, i think uh, it was a game that was calling for that a little bit but yeah. he but, uh, but you know I, I think there are a lot of good things there are he's allowed more uh, freelance motion on offense He's allowed these guys to play off each other more, which they do very well. That's why some of those catch and shoot threes, it's not because they're diagrammed that way. The movement's diagram, but he's allowing them to do what, what their instincts and cohesiveness tell them to do off of a lot of those sets. Sometimes against FSU and sometimes against UConn, they got oversaturated with the set mentality. Mm -hmm. But – other times and most of the time this year, okay, the set's not there. They can break off, morph into uh, something uh, fluid and constructive, which last year's team had a tough time doing. In fact, RJ told me early February last year that they never even worked on freelance offense. Yeah. It was just all set. So we're seeing Hubert evolve. This is just another area that – we don't know if he's evolved yet or not. This is just two games that people are fixating on, but they also happen to be two games the team was trailing in the first half mm -hmm. and trailing for a while in the second half. So there was a little bit more of, oh, my God, we got to win this game. How are we going to win this game? I can't use the bench if the starters aren't good enough. The you know, young coaches, and I say young, guys that haven't been around the block a million times and don't get phased by stuff, sometimes still don't know how to handle that. Yeah, you know, Trusting the process is something that they, they preach but don't always – exercise it takes time just like in any line of work it takes time you no different than the rest of us in that yeah sense yeah and i think and that's why that's why kentucky and oklahoma are good barometers just to see how the bench is used yeah no doubt and we'll have again we'll, we'll see what happens in those games and then i brought up one thing you reminded me too of we have seen Carolina, and I think one of the positive things with Hubert has been how we've seen Carolina play a little bit more in transition call a little bit less sets play play a little bit faster but again, focusing on the bench, that style of basketball means that your players are running up down the court more. They're sprinting more. That they're getting tired quicker. Yeah. That to me means if you're not going to play your bench as much, are you going to kind of have to go back to sets because guys are yeah. going to get tired? Is that's what best for the team? I think that's just something to keep in mind too. If you want to play a faster style of basketball, it seems like you have to rotate more to keep guys fresher. I mean, yeah, and, and I'm all for that. But I think having a bench like this isn't just about resting the starters. No, yeah, they I think can, having those a bench guys like this something. is about forcing mm -hmm. the other team to prepare for more variations, mm -hmm. more guys. Mm -hmm. In football, if you're a multiple offense 
and you can run power, you can run dives, you can run wide, you have a little option game going on in there, you have the short passing game, you got tight ends over the middle, you got dudes you can take the top off, you stress the crap out of a defense before they ever come out of the field for warm-ups because there's so much they have to be aware of. Mm-hmm. And basketball and the kind of composition that this bench has – you know, Jalen Withers should have nights where he goes for 14 points. 100%. Washington has nights he should go for 10, 12, 14 points. Trimble's already done it a couple of times. That's you need teams to be aware that it's more than just, well, if you can keep the ball from Armando, then they need both Harrison and RJ to have good shooting games where we can beat them. You don't mm-hmm. want to become that. Mm-hmm. And you run the risk of becoming that if if uh, Cormac Ryan continues to be sort of hot and cold, which is what he's been in his career. He's been a very streaky shooter, but he's also been a streaky shooter. It's the guy that's forced to take a lot of shots because others won't Mm -hmm. because he has the ball and had the ball in his hands at shot clock situations at Notre Dame. And he's talked about, look, I take a lot of tough threes. Mm -hmm. I take a lot of tough shots. Now he could be choosier. He could be more economical with all that stuff. So the percentages should go up. It shouldn't be as streaky now. Mm-hmm. But you want to have as many different variations for an opponent to have to deal with and match. Don't match them. Make them match you. Yeah. I think they have the Roy, roster. Roy, that, yeah. You know, Roy would – some people would say, why isn't Roy going big? He's trying to make them match. If they're big and you go big, okay, that's good. But if they're big and you're not so big, they they got chased. Some of their big guys have to chase you or vice versa. So mm-hmm. um, I, I think that when you have enough parts – to make the other team adjust to you and be uber aware of a lot more than just a few guys, you, you have an edge before that team even gets off the bus. Yeah. So yeah. we'll see how that shapes out. We'll see how he uses that. He's a developing coach mm-hmm. still. It's only his third year. So let's see how this thing plays out. I, I find it to be very interesting, and it's going to be one of my main focuses when I head to Atlanta. Has to be. Yeah, I think it, it definitely has to be. And we're, real quickly, we're going to wrap this up in a second, but focusing on a little bit more of a positive side as we as we head out of this one, R.J. Davis playing at a really elite level right now, 27-plus points in all three of Carolina's matchups against ranked opponents. He's been, for me, the guy that's taken this team to a bit of a next level at times and has just hit some absolutely massive shots as well. And, A.J., I'm going to hold my hands up. I didn't think Harrison Inger was this good, man. I really didn't. I knew he was a good player. I thought he was going to have a good time at Carolina, but I have been thoroughly and, and really, really impressed with not only the versatility in his game, but the little bit of a, excuse my language, the FU that he brings to that court as well. The kid plays with an edge, man. He's fun to watch. So, again, Armando's been Armando. Had some, you know, it, we talked about it in the Bahamas, had some performances he wanted back. But, again, I think you've seen a good level from Armando once again. Cormac been a little bit up and down, but has shown the glimpses of, of what he can be Elliot Cadeau again, coming in. And I think kind of being the player that a lot of people thought he would be maybe exceeding expectations in some way so far, but again, a positive addition to Carolina's rotation and found himself in the starting lineup now. So, but for me to end on a positive note, I think RJ and Harrison are going to absolutely fantastic. If the, this year, if they keep playing at the level that they have been for most of this season, again, it's a Carolina team that I think can, can beat just about anyone. If, some of these other things can continue to develop and some of these other things can continue to kind of be figured out. Yeah. RJ is averaging 26.8 points a game or 26.6 points a game in their last five games. Yeah, he's been spectacular, man. He's been spectacular, but I don't think long-term that's a winning recipe. Yeah. Cause the over-reliance be, on him a little bit, maybe over-reliance kind of on him. And that means, what if, what if he has a terrible night? What if he's in foul trouble? If he turns yeah. an ankle, you know, look around, he's going to shoot the ball. You don't want to become that team. When was the last team to, to win a national championship that a guy averaging scoring like that? That's a long time ago in basketball. It's not in the last 35 like years. Kimber Walker like that. comes to mind, but I don't know. Yeah, but that's at that team. A yeah, bit. but what was the final score in their national title? Like they scored like 48 points, right? And they weren't a great team. They kind no, of got hot. They at weren't. Time. Yeah, yeah. They, weren't like a they, great team they had big guys. Year. They had big guys. They defended because yeah. those teams defended. Yeah. But yeah, RJ has been fantastic, and RJ is having a great year. And if RJ can score 26 points a night, shooting 13 shots on the floor instead of 18, yeah, that would be better for the team. Uh, so uh, RJ is awesome. I had RJ number one when I did the three stars pod. Someone thought it should be Ingram. I agree. I think I think that you can make a valid case for that. Yeah, because Ingram makes everybody better. But the last couple of games, we've seen such a such an overdose of a, of RJ. 
and not as much as some other guys outside of Ingram and, and maybe even Armando, the trend right now is you're going to start get very scoring specific in certain areas, scoring centric in certain areas. They need more balance. And they were balanced earlier. They were better. They need to be that way. So if, if RJ can keep scoring 20 plus, but he's doing it without taking a ton of shots, then I think that that's better for this team. They need some more balance. And part of that is Hubert figuring out how to make all this stuff work. Yeah, part of it's, it's Cormac it Ryan's got a hit. What's wild is Cormac's over six there, and it was a loud over six. Yeah, but the 15 points he scored against Tennessee was a very quiet 15. Mm-hmm. And Parker's three guys went for 20. Mm-hmm. So that makes sense. But I, I think he's a guy right now that fans sort of will – they'll – They'll focus more on when he screws up than when he does. And when he has a things. game like, yeah, yeah. Because I don't think a lot of people understand his game. They watched him or they saw him when he played at Notre Dame, but they didn't really watch him. They don't really mm-hmm. know his game yet. And I saw, I, I watched him, saw him a lot at Notre Dame, saw him a person at Notre Dame. And I think he's a phenomenal part to this team, but he does need to be more consistent with his scoring. There's no doubt about that. He's got to hit some of those shots because that changes some stuff. Uh, but you got to love what RJ's doing as a competitor. He's a gritty dude. That New York dog is coming out. He was talking about when he played for the for the New York Gauchos AAU team, which is dog centri- central, oh, yeah. man. And that's where a lot of his hoops fiber uh, was developed. So we're seeing that guy. I think he's looking like a NBA player right now. Oh yeah, Harrison Ingram has been phenomenal. He does everything well. He dips his hands into every basket. Really good. Yeah. And Armando the other night was a little disappointing after the quick start. But let's remember, he said in the locker room that he felt something pop. Yeah, he felt heard something pop in his knee, and um, w- you know, a couple of us asked him a few questions about it, and he said it affected him. If you go back and watch his free throws. Beforehand, perfect guys having a great year. Yeah, he did like, struggle for after, a while after afterward. Yeah. After he said he had trouble bending on the free throws, so mm-hmm. it was no longer a routine rhythm shot. So we'll see how he is with Kentucky. He said he would be fine. It'd be I mean, he still finished the game, but yeah. he said he'd be fine for Kentucky. So I'm not worried about Armando. He does need to play through contact a little bit better. Mm-hmm. And I think there's and another level need, he can go uh, this year. I think he can. I agree, him. but but he needs help. See, Agreed. they oh, UConn Agreed. was doubling him a lot because yeah, nobody else. Because Ryan wasn't hitting. Because Ryan wasn't hitting. <laughs> yeah. Cadeau's not going to shoot from the perimeter that much. Mm-hmm. Ryan was hitting. So suddenly it's just RJ and Harrison, and Harrison was having a tough time getting threes off for a good part of the game, which is why he was taking the ball in the lane. So Armando needs. Cormac Ryan to hit shots. If Cormac Ryan's hitting shots and all five dudes on the floor need to be guarded, then Armando's going to go 20 and 12 at least, or 18 and 12 every night. Yeah, you got to free him up a little but bit. Yeah. It's not, but he, he's, he's not great at playing through contact, doesn't have the greatest hands in the world. And you see that effect when he's trying to play through contact sometimes. And so if they, if they create an environment where he's almost always exclusively being guarded by one guy, that great spin move he has, that very much improved drop step move, that little get a guy in the hip with a little jump hook will be far more effective. He had two jump hooks in the first half the other night that were ugly, but also he got pounded in the body both times. Mm-hmm. And I think the second attempt came after the knee popped a little yeah. bit. So yeah. This is a this is a potentially very very good team. I think at times they've been very they, they're better than last year's team right now. If they played last year's team right today, they beat them nine out of ten times. Agreed. Eight out of ten. Times. Agreed. There's no doubt about it. They're, and they're built to be a club that should be able to handle the tournament because of that multiplicity, because the guards are so good and going to get better, so they can handle stuff like that. But they have a long way to go. They need to become more cohesive as a unit, and that's not going to happen going to the movies together. It's not going to happen you know, visiting Hubert in his office during the week. It'll help. Those things don't hurt, but it's going to happen when these guys get time on the floor. This is sort of a spot in the schedule right now where you almost wish for them that instead of having Kentucky and Atlanta and Oklahoma and Charlotte, that they were playing Toledo at home. Agreed. And maybe uh, Central Florida. Oh, they're 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 a power conference team now. Toledo at home, and maybe um, someone like 
Wichita or maybe yeah. even Wichita, like Evansville, like mid level, something like that. Yeah. Second tier type program, someone from the Mountain West. Mm-hmm. bring in Utah state or something like that. Have them play someone like that. A club that's pretty good. Got some good athletes, got some length and everything, but it seems that they should be able to beat, but also use that bench and get a lot out of the game. If they were playing Elon three times, they wouldn't get nearly as much out of it. Mm-hmm. So they're going to get a lot out of playing Kentucky and Oklahoma, but right now, since they've played a good enough schedule, this team would really be helped by having a couple of home games like that. Oh yeah. So he could agree. work everybody in and give them a lot of time without worrying too too much about the result and yep. if the result is tight and you need to run with the starters to get a w then you do that but if if you have the bench playing 75 minutes in that game then you're going to get a lot out of it yeah but they don't have that so that's not where they stand no tough games coming up man it doesn't get any easier it's been a gauntlet but i think again i think carolina's handled it well and again a lot of positives a lot of optimism some things that we talked about today that you know need to be addressed and need to be kind of figured out and worked out and i'm sure they will be and we'll see how it plays out over the next couple weeks in particular but a nice gap here some time for carolina to rest recover practice ahead of again some tough games against kentucky and and um Oklahoma after that as well. It doesn't get any easier for the Tar Heels, but I agree with you, AJ. And I think a lot of Carolina fans feel the same way. They just team has the potential to be really good and do some really, really good things in, in March. And especially in ACC play with the way the league's looking right now, it's a competitive league. But I think in terms of the top of that league right now, I think Carolina's looking like, I think we're a good enough team to win this conference. And I agree with that. Yeah, but, they are. Yeah. But, they, they, Cause they, they've looked yeah, a lot better than playoff. Duke so far. Clemson's yeah. looked really good. Um, Clubs is going to be up there. Miami's going to be up there. Miami mm-hmm. had that stretch against Kentucky. They're really good. But Carolina can Virginia win. Virginia maybe, too. It's been pretty good so far. Yeah, I want to see more firepower. But uh, uh, Carolina can win this league. <laughs> Carolina could win this league. Carolina could be the best team in the league. I agree. I think it's a uh, it's it's there for the taking, and we'll see how it plays out. But I think that's yeah. I think that's a good place to call it for this show. Yes, it is. I do, and I'm going to go ahead and, and give a shout out real quick to Underdog Fantasy. They are the official fantasy partner of TarHillIllustrated.com. Super easy to use as well. Just go on the app and pick a, pick whether your favorite players have a higher or lower stat total than what is listed. Just do that with two to five different players, and you're in business. Go five for five, and you get twenty x your money as well. It sounds pretty nice right now so for example i'm using the sam howell example it was the basketball show going to use a football example in this one all you have to do let's say he's playing this weekend on sunday they've got him projected to throw for 200 yards you think he's going to go higher than that you just select the higher button if he throws for 202 you win it's that simple as long as it's above 200 or whatever it's set that that's all it takes super easy to use super simple to use and you can be a casual sports fan and play this game no um, no problem at all. So again, check them out uh, at underdogfantasy.com or you can view them in the app store as well. Just download the app over there and make sure you use the promo code HEEL, H-E-E-L, when you sign up to get that first deposit doubled up to $100. Must be 18 plus and present in a state where Underdog Fantasy operates. Terms apply. Concerned with your play? Call 1-800-522-4700 or visit ncpgambling.org. Links in the description below. Head on over there and get signed up with that promo code HEEL. Big thank you to them for sponsoring this show but i've been jacob turner he's been andrew jones like the video below if you're feeling good about this carolina basketball team right now i think this should get a lot of likes based on what we're hearing on our boards and on social media from carolina fans right now though it's a pretty optimistic time for the tar heels so i'm expecting a good amount of likes on this show even though we mostly addressed a negative on here we could have talked a thousand positives but we're gonna do another show next week yeah leading in leading into the kentucky game and and, and we'll We'll hit on the other stuff then. This is what people are, are talking about. I hadn't talked about it yet. And it, it's been, we, it's, we again, I wanted to talk to you about that. I hadn't talked to you about bench production this, no. this week up until this, I wanted to talk to you because it, again, it's, it's popular amongst fans and based on the reception I got from some of my tweets about it, I know it's something that Carolina fans are noticing as well. So we had to address it, but again, but there's no, a lot plenty of more a lot of stuff. Yeah. Lots of good things. And we'll hit on that next week. Yeah, no doubt about it. But again, keep it locked to tarlistrade.com for all your coverage of Carolina football, basketball, and recruiting. If you want to sign up to be a premium subscriber, just say 33 a month links in the description below, head on over there. You can be a care line insider too. Again, I'm Jacob Turner. He's Andrew Jones. Appreciate y'all watching and uh, we'll see y'all next time. Thanks.